Welcome to Virology. My name is Vincent Racaniello. I'll be your professor for this entire course. I am a scientist, yeah, you bet. I'm a scientist at the Medical Center of Columbia. So I do not reside here on campus. I'm up at the Medical Center at 168th Street. I have a laboratory that's been doing research on viruses for 35 years. I absolutely love viruses. I think I love them more than my family, but don't tell them. And that's why I'm teaching this course. I don't have to teach anything to anyone, but I love viruses so much, I want you to as well. So that's my goal for this course, to tell you everything I know about virology and viruses, to get you incredibly excited about this field, and you'll go out in the world understanding all there is to know about viruses, vaccines, and so forth. So the next time there's an outbreak, you will understand what's going on. We live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. Viruses infect every living thing on the planet. Every living thing has a virus that infects it. Even virus-infected cells have viruses that infect them. And we are on a daily basis, touching, eating, and breathing billions of viruses. One student last year told me, after taking this course, he didn't eat anything or touch anything any longer because he was afraid of being infected. But I don't want you to be afraid of viruses. One of my goals is for you to appreciate how amazing they are. This room is full of viruses. The air is full of them. If we sampled it, we could detect many different kinds of viruses. The surfaces are covered with them. The doorknob in particular would be an interesting site to look for viruses. Whenever you eat food, you're always eating viruses. If you had coleslaw today, it's full of insect viruses. The insects crawl over the cabbage as it's growing in the field, and they have viruses that they deposit, and you eat them. There are lots of them, but they do you no harm, and they don't even infect you because they are insect viruses. So our contact with viruses is continuous. You're never in a position where you're not contacting a virus. In fact, we carry them in our genetic material. We have viral genomes as part of our own genome, and these are things we'll be talking about quite a bit uh, in this course. Now, when we talk about all the viruses that are around us and on the planet, it's, it's the numbers that are amazing. And one of the strategies for viral reproduction is to make billions and billions of particles. I sound a little like Carl Sagan, but I'm not trying to be. They make so many offspring because many of them do not succeed in infecting a new cell. For example, bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. Here's a picture of one of them here, a very famous picture. There are over 10 to the 30th bacteriophages in the waters of the earth, all well, the oceans and fresh waters. 10 to the 30th, people have calculated this based on sampling uh, various areas. Now that number is incredibly huge. It's more than Avogadro's number. And it's so big that if you took all of these uh, particles, their biomass alone, if you weighed them all, they all weigh about a femtogram, uh, the biomass alone exceeds that of elephants by over a thousandfold. But maybe even more amazingly, if you put them head to tail, these 10 to the 30th virus particles, they would reach 100 million light years. This is a huge distance. These are things you can't even see. And the calculations, if you're interested, are at this website. So that just shows you how big a number 10 to the 30th is, 100 million light years. Another example of the numbers strategy when it comes to viruses. These, this is a, uh, a whale, of course, and whales are commonly infected with a small uh, RNA virus called the Khaleesi virus. It's related to viruses that cause gastroenteritis in humans, and we'll be talking about those later on. These whales, uh, may get sick, they may have rashes and blisters, they may also get uh, gastroenteritis. They shed 10 to the 13th particles per gram of feces every day. So these whales are swimming in the ocean excreting virus particles, and that's just one whale. Every whale can be infected in a similar way. Other mammals in the oceans and fishes as well can be infected in shedding viruses. So 
the oceans of the world are teeming with viruses. I, mean, I want you to remember that next time you go swimming, you know, you take water in your mouth and spit it out. I want you to remember that it's full of viruses. They're probably okay, they're not gonna harm you, but just know that they are there, you can't see them. Let's go back to the numbers uh, issue again. If we, first of all, there are more viruses in a liter of coastal seawater than there are people on Earth. So pick up a liter of water and look at it. And you got more particles in there than people. This is just amazing. If we look at the abundance of viruses versus uh, bacteria, archaea, and protists, that's what's shown in the pie chart here. So on the left, we are looking at biomass. Uh, it, on the planet, mostly in the oceans. That's where these measurements have been taken out. Prokaryotes, which really should be bacteria and archaea, this is a mixture of the two, uh, is the majority of the biomass in the oceans. And the viruses and the protists are small slices. But if you look at particle number, at abundance, viruses outnumber everything else. 94% of all the particles in the oceans are viruses, and bacteria, archaea, and protists are in the minimum. So there are a lot of particles on the planet. HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, the causative agent of AIDS. At the moment, there are about 35 million infected people on the planet. That translates to about 10 to the 16th genomes in total. That's also a huge number. How big is it? Well, in that number of genomes, there is already some genome that is resistant to every antiviral we have today, we have over 30, 30 different antivirals against HIV specifically. So already in the 10 to the 16th, there's resistance to all of those. It's just a matter of it coming out. But there's also resistance to everything we could ever develop in our lifetimes. It's a huge number, which would cover any, any type of antiviral that we could develop. So as I said, the numbers mean a lot with respect to virus infections. We'll be talking about this a lot in this course, how the numbers drive evolution of virus particles. It's part of the whole strategy for their existence. Now, can you raise your hand if you've ever had a, a virus infection? Okay, so this year, almost everyone has their hand up. Some years I get 10%, some, some years 50%. But in fact, you've all been infected. You all have within you right now viruses of some sort. All of us have all of these herpes viruses in us. We get infected at quite an early age. Uh, herpes simplex 1 and 2, varicella zoster, human cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, and then the herpes viruses, human herpes viruses 6, 7, and 8. They infect us early on in life, and that's it. You never get rid of them. They cause latent infections that are periodically reactivated, and that's how you spread virus to others. So all of you, if I did a serological survey of you, I would bet that 90% of you have uh, antibodies to all of these viruses. So that's just a dozen right there. But you also have many, many other viruses in you. And we're beginning to learn this as we sequence different tissues from people as well as other animals. We realize that there are viruses in us continuously that don't seem to be doing us uh, any harm. Now, I'm sure all of you know that we're, along with our human cells, we have with us a microbiome composed of many different types of bacteria. And I used to say in previous years that there were 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in our body. That estimate was just uh, revised. A paper came out last week saying it's closer to one to one, but it's still a lot of bacteria. And this slide shows you all the different parts of the body that have bacteria. Very, virtually everywhere you look, we have a specific microbiome composed of different kinds of bacteria on your skin, throughout your alimentary and respiratory tracts, urogenital tracts. All of the fluids we used to think were sterile are not probably sterile. People have even think there are bacteria in our brains. And these bacteria live with us, they get things from us, and we get things from them. They do amazing things for us. But this is not a course on bacteria, this is a course on viruses. And we're now beginning to realize that we have a virome within us as well, and I'm betting that that virome is also beneficial. So here is the result of some very recent studies. As I said, people are taking various uh, tissues and fluids and simply sequencing all the nucleic acids in them to find out what viruses are present. Now the easiest <laughs> fluid to obtain, of course, is blood. And on the right is a depiction 
of the percent of the, of the sequences that you find in blood, in circulating blood in a human, uh, which come from different origins. So here viruses are 68% of the sequences that you find in human blood. So those herpes viruses that we just talked about, but also many other kinds of DNA and RNA viruses, and some of those are just listed on the left here. Now you can see uh, eukaryotes, 3.6%. Uh, and bacteria, 9.5%. This is just taking blood and looking at the sequences. Here on the bottom is very interesting. About 15% of the sequences that you get are unknown. If we look at the sequence, it doesn't match anything in a database. So these are really interesting things that maybe we'll uh, learn about at some point. But if you look in various organs of humans besides blood, you see lots and lots of different viruses. And these are all different virus families of DNA and RNA containing viruses. And we'll learn about some of these in the coming weeks. But suffice it to say that not just in the intestines, but all in and around us, we have lots of viruses. In fact, when you were born, at the moment of birth, you have a gut virome, which you've inherited from your mother by drinking her amniotic fluid. The maternal amniotic fluid is full of viruses. You get those, and then in the first few weeks of life, they shape your microbiome. Many of those viruses infect the bacteria in your gut, and they shape the way your microbiome matures. So it's really early days in understanding this virome, but in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna understand how it contributes to our health. I mentioned earlier that we have uh, about, we have viral genomes uh, in our chromosomal DNA. And this is a pie chart of our 3.2 billion bases and what it's composed of. I always find it amusing to see that only 1.5% of our, our DNA actually codes for proteins. You know, the rest are things like introns and various uh, repeated sequences like lines and signs. But look up here, 8.3% uh, LTR retrotransposons. These are sequences that have been introduced into our genome by a particular virus family, the retroviruses. These are RNA viruses that make a copy of their genome as DNA when they infect cells, and then that integrates into our DNA and remains there forever. And these sequences in humans are, are not productive. They don't make infectious virus particles. So they entered us many, many years ago, probably before we were homo sapiens, and we've kept them ever since. And in fact, some of them are beneficial. We've begun to learn that some of these retroviral sequences actually help us. So I think you get the idea that we have lots of viruses in and around us. So all of you look pretty healthy. Why is that? You don't get sick from a viral infection very often. Well, it turns out we have a great immune system to take care of that. And immune, immunology is a big part of studying viruses. And some of you I know have taken uh, Moshewitz's course on immunology last semester. We will touch on it very briefly to understand how the immune system interacts with viruses. But of course, we don't have time to go in detail because this is not an immunology course. But suffice it to say that a healthy person has a good immune system, will be able to fight off most virus infections. But when your immune system is down, then you can get really in big trouble. For example, if you get immunosuppressed, if you are having an organ transplant and you have to take drugs to prevent organ rejection, you're gonna get a virus infection. All those viruses that are in you will suddenly uh, start replicating. A big problem in people who get organ transplants, for example, is reactivation of the latent herpes viruses that you have. All of us have cytomegalovirus, and when you get immunosuppressed to get an organ transplant, they can replicate and cause serious disease because your immune system is suppressed and can't deal with it. If you get a virus infection that happens to immunosuppress, like HIV or measles virus, these immunosuppress and they allow very simple virus infections that we can all deal with normally to become big problems. So we have this wonderful interplay between our virome and our immune system. And as I said, we think many of these viruses we carry are beneficial, and the, the immune system keeps them in check. As soon as you alter the balance, they can replicate out of control uh, and cause problems. Let me give you a few examples of viruses that seem to do good things. Uh, here is an example of a small DNA-containing virus, a polyomavirus we'll talk about extensively in this course, that infects everyone by a certain age. It seems to cause no disease in healthy people. Again, only if you are immunosuppressed do polyomaviruses cause problems. 
This virus is passed from between, among family members. So when you are born, you get your virus from your mother, and you will pass your virus on to your offspring as well. It's not part of the germline, but it's simply transmitted by close contact within families. We can take, these viruses exist in different populations on the planet, and they're distinct enough that we can actually trace uh, human migration on the planet by seeing which of these polyomaviruses that they harbor. So this map shows you two different versions of human migrations out of Africa. The dotted line is based on the genome sequence. You can see uh, humans moving into Europe and Asia and the Americas. And the dark line is doing the same analysis using these polyomaviruses to track the different populations. And you can see you get more detailed information about where populations have gone. This is a wonderful example of a plant virus which is beneficial to the plant. There is a grass called Dicanthelium languinosum which grows near hot springs in Yellowstone National Park, for example, near the hot water, which is over 50 degrees Celsius. These grasses thrive and you can take them into the laboratory and show that they grow very well at high temperatures as well. The reason they grow well is because they're colonized with a fungus, Curvularia protuberata. It's a fungus that lives within the plant. If you cure the plant of this fungus, the, the plant will no longer grow at high temperatures. But it's not just the fungus that you need. It, the fungus is actually infected with a virus, Curvularia protuberata virus. If you take the virus out of the fungus and just put the fungus in the plant, it's not enough to confer uh, growth at high temperatures. So a viral fungal plant symbiosis is needed to confer this very interesting property of growing at high temperatures. An experiment was done about a year ago here in New York City at NYU in mice, uh, which also shows the beneficial value of virus infections. Now, you can grow mice in the laboratory so that they are germ-free. They don't have any microbes in them. And when you do that, you know, the mice will grow and live, but their intestinal morphology and immune system is aberrant. So these are sections from uh, these mice. So here are germ-free animals on the left. These are sections of small intestine. And the, um, the morphology is abnormal. You can compare it to conventional mice, which have a full complement of bacteria. So this is the normal villus structure. You can see it's aberrant in the germ-free animals. And furthermore, the immune system in the gut is not properly developed. Uh, in normal animals, the immune system is characterized by a lot of T cells, and you can see those staining brown in these sections. Uh, and in the germ-free mice, the number of T cells is vastly reduced. So the bacterial complement in the gut helps the gut to develop and helps the immune system to develop. If you take these germ-free mice and infect them with murine norovirus, this is related to the virus I showed you in the whales and related to viruses that give us gastroenteritis, if you infect these germ-free animals with that virus, it corrects the morphological defect in the intestine and restores the immune function. You can do this with mice that have aged a bit as well. So if they've grown up for months as germ-free, you can now infect them, and the virus restores the proper morphology and immune function to the gut. So this is a mouse, it's not a human, and we don't know if the same thing happens in people, but I bet there is some virus that contributes in a similar way to our gut development. It's not easy to do those experiments in people, but eventually we'll get there as well. So these are just some examples of why I think virology is an amazing field. Viruses are amazing, and I wanna teach you what I know about them, because I think you'll be amazed as well. One of the other neat things about the field, besides learning uh, about viruses themselves, is that virology is what I call an integrative science. To understand viruses, you need to know all kinds of other sciences, not just biology, but biochemistry, cell biology, molecular biology, even physiology and ecology, if we go out in nature and look at how viruses interact with populations. A couple of years ago in this course, after the last lecture, a student came down and thanked me for the course. And it turned out she was a freshman. And I said, well, you're not supposed to take this course until you have a biology class. She said, well, I got an A. And uh, she, she said then, 
I will do better in biology next year because of this course. So virology puts all of that other science to a practical sense. It, it tells you why you need certain aspects of cell biology and biochemistry to allow the viruses to grow. So that's what I mean when I say that virology is an integrative science. And I think by the end of the course, you'll see that as well. So here are my goals for this course. Uh, first of all, I want you to see the big picture of virology. I'm not going to make you memorize dozens and dozens of viruses, how they replicate and how they cause disease. That is not how you learn virology for the first time. I'm going to show you the steps in a viral replicative cycle that are common among all viruses. We're going to talk about how viruses cause disease, how to prevent infections, immune responses, and so forth. So every lecture will be based on a different aspect of virology. So that's what I mean by the big picture. I want you to think of virology as an integrated discipline, not RNA and DNA and different conformations and different capsid structures and so forth. You're not going to learn anything by memorizing that. There are plenty of people out there at different colleges who teach virology that way, and I think that's completely wrong. I think your first course, you need to know how viruses replicate, and that's what I'm going to teach you. And then if you want to take an advanced course, you can study herpes viruses and influenza and polio and so, so forth. Then it will make perfect sense to you. And in the end, you're going to know all about these wizards. You're going to know more about viruses than 99.9% .9 of the world. And mostly viruses scare people out there when there's an outbreak, for example, Ebola virus last year, Zika virus at the moment, people get scared. In particular, the press goes crazy because they don't understand it. My feeling is if you don't understand things, they scare you. And that's why, that's another reason why I want you to learn virology. Because some point in the future, you'll be able to explain to people what's going on. I get emails all the time from past students who say, I just saw this outbreak and I understand exactly what's going on. And I can see how the press isn't representing it properly. So those are my goals uh, for this course. Now here's an example of a CNN news report that issued back in 2009 when we had a new strain of influenza virus uh, circulating cause a pandemic. And I did a screen capture of this because I find it really interesting. So they were summarizing the results of animal studies. People had taken this virus strain, this brand new strain, and infected ferrets, which are a good model for flu. And they'd found that the virus ravages the lungs it causes lesions, it doesn't stay in the head. Well, what they neglected to say in this news program was that these were ferret results. They were implying that this would happen in people. And one thing I do want you to remember after this course is we call them animal models for a reason. They're models and we don't extrapolate from an animal to people. If you develop a drug or a vaccine in an animal, you have to still test it in people. You can't just start selling a drug that's passed all the tests in animals. So likewise, if you find things with uh, ferret models of flu, you can't extrapolate to, them to humans. And in fact, it turned out that this strain was pretty mild in people and didn't cause serious disease. But I don't think the press really understands this. Or if they do, they know that they can fool a lot of people and scare them. And that's what drives uh, the press, unfortunately. So that's one thing I want to make you immune to uh, in the future. So let's take a break and take another question over at Socrative. Okay, the next one is, it's up there, which is true, all viruses make us sick and can be lethal. Our immune system can manage most viral infections. Humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. The press is usually correct in their virology reporting or our immune system it cannot handle most virus infections.
All right, most of you, 99% answered right. B, our immune system can manage most viral infections. And that's what I told you, unless, they're down, unless your immune system is down, of course. If you're immunosuppressed, that's not the case. But uh, all viruses don't make us sick. We have men, much more than one virus at a time. Uh, this the press, of course, and, and just a few people said the immune system cannot handle most virus infections. So let's start by defining what is a virus. This will keep with us for the rest of this course. This is my definition, which has actually evolved over the years. A virus is an infectious, obligate, intracellular parasite that has genetic material, can be DNA or RNA, and it's surrounded by a protein coat and sometimes an envelope derived from a host cell membrane. So it's infectious, meaning it can go from cell to cell or host to host. It gets inside of the cell of the host. So it's an obligate intracellular parasite. Viruses need to enter cells in order to replicate. The viruses sitting on this table can do nothing until they account, encounter a cell, get into it, and utilize the replicative uh, machinery of the cell to make more of themselves. So that's what we mean by obligate intracellular parasite. A parasite is an organism that takes something from another. There are other kinds of parasites which aren't intracellular. They're not viruses, but viruses are intracellular and they have to get in a cell in order to replicate. They, the genetic material can be DNA like ours or RNA, very unusual. They can have RNA as genetic material. And this is probably because RNA was the first nucleic acid on Earth, and viruses, RNA viruses probably evolved first, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, this nucleic acid typically has a protein coat around it, and then some viruses are just that. Here's a virus, adenovirus, for example, which is DNA surrounded by a protein coat. But sometimes there's, in addition, uh, a lipid membrane around the virus particle, and that is derived always from the host cell. Now, later on in this course, we're going to talk about uh, a kind of virus called a viroid, which is naked nucleic acid. It's naked RNA. And uh, this encodes very few proteins. And this transmits successfully from plant to plant. So it doesn't need a protein shell to protect it. So there are obviously some exceptions, although we do call those viroids to distinguish them from viruses. But I think for now, this, this definition will serve us well. Now, when we study viruses, because they are obligate intracellular parasites. When we study them, we automatically learn about cellular processes. We have learned about so many cellular processes by simply studying virus-infected cells. It's amazing. For example, splicing of pre-mRNAs was discovered in virus-infected cells, the cap structure on viral mRNA. So many more steps in cell biology were discovered by people studying virus-infected cells. So remember that when you learn about what a virus does, you learn about the host. Now, an interesting question that many people have, and on my blog I get lots of, this is probably the most searched for topic on my blog, are viruses living or are viruses alive? And it's typically high school students doing their homework. Their teacher asks them, find out if viruses are alive or not. They end up on my web page. <laughs> and here I put up a poll. Uh, a number of years ago, are viruses alive? I gave them three options. Yes, no, uh, in between, or I don't know. And these are the votes of uh, almost 6,000 votes. You can see they're pretty evenly split among yes, no, or something in between. People tend to get very polarized when you ask them, are viruses living? On the other hand, I've been thinking about this for 40 years or so. And my th thoughts on this have evolved uh, on the process. And I want to give you now what I think is the answer. And it really depends on what you mean when you say a virus. Most people, when, you, when they think of a virus, they're thinking of a virus particle, those tiny things that have to get into a cell in order to reproduce. I think of a virus as an organism with two phases. So we have the virus particle, which I'll also call the virion in this course, virion meaning the infectious virus particle. And then there's the infected cell. The virion cannot be alive. It is nucleic acid and protein. How can this be alive? It has no capacity to do anything. 
It just waits to get into a cell. But once it infects a cell, it completely takes over the cell to making more virus particles. So now the infected cell is really uh, a virus infected cell. It's part of the organism, so that is living. So that's how I view it. So when you say virus, uh, you mean really an organism with two phases. You mean the virus particle, which is not living, and the infected cell, uh, which certainly is. Now, this may sound simple, but no matter how much I explain it, I find a lot of people still, when they talk about virus, they're thinking about a virus particle. And you can certainly have your own opinion on this. It's not one of these things that's written in stone. I will never ask you the question and have a, the answer be yes or no. But it's a really interesting thing to think about. Now, one caution that I will give you at this early point in our course. Be careful and try to avoid anthropomorphic analyses about viruses. Do not try to ascribe them human actions in any way. For example, viruses do not think. This virus thinks it's going to infect this cell. Viruses don't employ, ensure, exhibit, display, etc. Why do I say this? Because viruses don't achieve their goals in a human-centric manner. What we think is the logic for what a virus does in its life cycle may, com may be completely wrong because we are looking at it from human terms. And viruses are simply passive chemicals that react to their environment. And we have no way of predicting how that will happen uh, from a human viewpoint. So many people do use anthropomorphic analyses to describe viruses. And in fact, in the popular press, you will see it all the time. Because, in fact, it turns out it's much easier to write it that way if you say viruses have to do this. I try to avoid it, but even I can't avoid it because it just is quicker to say it that way rather than by doing it in a convoluted manner. So this probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you at some point, but I think by the end of the course when we've gone over a lot of scenarios in virology, you'll see that what we think should happen uh, isn't what actually does happen in the virus world, and that's why we shouldn't apply human values to virus infections. <clears throat> now, besides the property of being obligate intracellular parasites, viruses are very small. In fact, the original definition of a virus, as you'll see in a moment, was that they could pass through a 0.2 micron filter, whereas bacteria could not. We threw out that part of the definition because, as you'll see, we've got huge viruses now that never make it through a 0.2 micron filter. But here, just to give you an example of the size, here's an E. coli magnified about 100,000 times, and attached to it is a bacteriophage to give you a sense of the size of the phage versus the bacterium. Uh, here's HIV in the right scale. So it's quite, quite large a virus, relatively speaking. And this is a rod-shaped virus called tobacco mosaic virus. It was the first virus discovered. Now in this box are a collection of different viruses and other molecules, and it's expanded here. So now we have a million-fold magnification. Uh, here is a ribosome, for example. And just below it is poliovirus, which is about the same size as a ribosome. So some viruses get down to very small sizes, 20 to 30 nanometers uh, in diameter. Here's a tRNA, for example, an antibody molecule. There's a carbon atom uh, right there. So viruses are small. Uh, and this is another slide which will give you a sense of the scale. Here at the bottom is a cell uh, which has on its outside some herpes virus particles, which are quite large. They're 200 nanometers in diameter. But you can see next to them are some polioviruses, which are about 10 times smaller. And here are the ribosomes uh, inside of the cell. So relative to the cell, uh, you can certainly see the larger viruses. Uh, but the smaller ones tend to disappear. Uh, and so that's, that's more or less the range of virus size. Now on the top uh, is a scale showing you the size of various biological components uh, down from um, atoms all the way up through plant and animal cells. And you can see uh, the viruses are right in here. They overlap with ribosomes and bacteria. And some of the viruses I'll tell you about in a moment are actually larger uh, than bacteria. And these are the various uh, methodologies that we need to use in order to visualize these components. Of course, X-ray crystallography and NMR, you would need to see small proteins and ribosomes. The viruses can be visualized by X-ray uh, and the electron microscope as well. And some of the viruses I'll tell you about today and later as well can be seen in the light microscope. 
And that is unprecedented because the original viruses that were discovered in the early 1900s could not be seen until the, light, the electron microscope was developed. So how many viruses can you fit on the head of a pin? This is a website which you can find. It has a really nice illustration. It's actually a movie where you can move a slider and zoom in onto this pin. So a pin is about 2 millimeters or 2,000 microns uh, in diameter. And you could fit about 500 million rhinoviruses on the head of a pin. Uh, this is a dust mite right here. And the box is expanded here. It has red blood cells, lymphocytes, uh, yeast cells, pollen grains. Uh, here are some bacteria, the long uh, bacteria and the um, spherical ones here, the bacilli and the, and the cocci. And then this collection in the middle are the viruses. You can just see Ebola virus there. It's quite large. And the rhinoviruses you can't even see at this zoom. And, but anyway, 500 million rhinoviruses would fit on the head of a pin. And when you sneeze, you know, you expel many, many droplets of fluids. And each droplet contains thousands of rhinoviruses. So when you sneeze, you can infect many, many uh, other people. Now, we used to think viruses were quite small. As I said, 0.2 microns was the criteria for identifying viruses by size. But recently, many huge giant viruses have been discovered. And this on the left is the cover of a magazine that illustrates that. Uh, here's rhinovirus, which I've been telling you, 500 million of those will fit on the head of a pin. It's about 30 nanometers in diameter. Uh, here is HIV, which is about 10 times larger. But above it is Mimi virus, which was discovered over 10 years ago, the biggest virus known to date, 750 uh, microns in diameter. And in this infected cell, you can see two Mimi virus particles. Uh, and in here is a virus that at the time was thought to be the biggest virus particle known. Ever since this discovery, people have started actively to look for giant viruses because they're intriguing for a, for a number of reasons, which I'll tell you in a moment. Here is one. Uh, discovered very recently. It's called Pandora virus. It is visible under the light microscope. These are Pandora virus particles simply viewed by phase contrast. They're two microns long. They're longer than some bacteria. Two microns, 2,000 nanometers, much bigger than the 0.2 microns uh, of the filters. And these viruses have huge genomes, millions of base pairs encoding all sorts of proteins that we don't even recognize. And that's why they're called Pandora viruses, because we don't know what most, most of the proteins do. It's like opening Pandora's uh, vase. Now, viruses replicate quite differently from bacteria. This is another essential feature. We're going through some of the cardinal features of viruses. Now, let's, to, let's look at bacteria, which are on the bottom here. You take a, a broth culture, introduce a single bacterium into the culture, it will divide to produce two cells, and those will divide again and produce four, et cetera. This is binary fission. Bacteria simply divide as our cells do. And eventually, uh, the culture will plateau when the nutrients run out. Viruses do not replicate that way, although the first scientists who discovered virologists thought they did. They thought they replicated by binary fission, but they were surprised when they did some experiments and got a totally different answer. They replicate by assembly of preformed components. The virus infects the cell. The genome directs the synthesis of proteins that are needed to assemble new virus particles. So if you infect cells with a virus, there is an eclipse period during which you don't see any new viruses made. So this is a graph of time versus the number of infectious virus particles made. Remember, in bacteria, very quickly after you inoculate the broth, the bacteria start to divide, but not for the viruses. There is a time period during which the viruses are making the parts needed to make new viruses, and then at a certain point, you start to have production of new viruses. So this is a key difference between the way viruses and bacteria multiply. All right, number three, which is true? A, viruses must assemble using preformed components. Bacteria do not replicate via binary fission as viruses do. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. Viruses do not have an eclipse period. Viruses replicate by binary fission. Okay, most of you got A, which is correct. Viruses must assemble using preformed components. Bacteria, of course, do replicate by binary fission and they don't, bacteria divide, they don't assemble using uh, preformed 
components. How old are viruses? We're going to have a lecture on the evolution of viruses. Really interesting stuff. We know way more nowadays than we did when I first started teaching this uh, in 2000, uh, 2010. We can do a lot of sequencing of viruses and get estimates of molecular change. And when you do that, it's quite clear that the dinosaurs 150, 200 million years ago had viruses, including herpes viruses. You can find a picture of T-Rex on the internet with cold sores on his face. But they probably originated way before that. We can see integrated pieces of viral sequences in the genomes of many different animals. And by doing phylogenetic lineages, we can trace many viruses even earlier. But even more than that, there are some analyses nowadays which suggest that re self-replicating RNA molecules, which we would view as a virus, actually were present uh, before cellular life began on Earth. So we think RNA viruses replicating in very distinct compartments on Earth uh, predated cells, and then DNA viruses came later. So they're quite old. They're billions of years old. In terms of written history, we can see uh, in, on this uh, vase, this Greek vase from 700 BC, for example, uh, inscribed with this rabid Hector which probably refers to rabies virus, but of course at this point we didn't know what rabies virus was. On the right is an Egyptian carving from uh, 1300 or so BC, which we think depicts uh, an individual with a leg that is typical of the paralysis of polio. So you can find references to diseases throughout recorded history that look like viral diseases, but it was much, much later than we actually discovered what a virus was. We actually practiced immunization against viral infections without knowing that they were caused by viruses. In the 11th century, China used to pr uh, practice a, a process called variolation. Smallpox was widespread at this time. It wasn't known what caused smallpox, just that it was an infectious disease that could go from person to person. The practice was to take the pustules of smallpox, which formed on the skin, grind them up, and infect a, a person with them as kind of a protection. People found that if you did this, about 30% of the people would die of smallpox, but the rest were prevented from being infected for the rest of their life. And Lady Montague, who was the British ambassador to Turkey, brought this back to the UK in the 1700s. And in fact, in the colonies, in the American colonies, this was widely practiced as well. At the end of the 1700s, uh, Edward Jenner in England actually did an experiment to establish what was going on here using a non-lethal virus related to smallpox virus, and that was the beginning of vaccination. But Jenner did not know he was working with a virus. He, w he knew he was working with an agent that was infectious. The whole concept of microorganisms begins uh, with Leeuwenhoek in the 1700s who made the first microscopes and he began to look at various fluids and see small things in them. You know, people thought the visible world at this time was all that there was, that there wasn't anything smaller. Well, he showed differently. He showed that there were microorganisms. And of course, Pasteur showed that these microorganisms could grow in broth, that they could be responsible for making cheese, making milk sour, and producing wine. So he showed that there are bacteria that can grow, microscopic bacteria that can grow and do these things. And finally, at the end of the 1800s, Robert Koch in Germany showed that bacteria could cause disease. So this is the first time where we're understanding that these infectious diseases that cause illness in people are actually caused by microorganisms. But we're not talking about viruses yet, still bacteria. The end of the 1800s, first virus discovered was the virus that causes this disease in tobacco plants. This was called tobacco mosaic disease. And already at the time, tobacco was a big product. People used to like to smoke it in cigars and pipes. So this was a big problem because it made the leaves unsuitable for sale. So a variety of scientists were trying to figure out what was causing it. And their first thought, of course, their first thought was that it was a bacterium because that's what everyone was thinking at the time after Pasteur and Koch. So what they would do is grind up the leaves of sick tobacco leaves with a, with a buffer and then put them through a filter to try and filter out the bacteria. And they did so using these Birkfield filters. So these were uh, sintered glass filters made at the time, and they could control the porosity of the filter. And you would introduce the 
uh, the extract of the plant leaves into the top and then filter, filter it through. And they consistently found that what passed through the filter when inoculated onto new leaves would cause the disease. It wasn't what was retained on the filter, the bacteria, and all the other experiments that had been done in Koch's experiments and so forth, it was what was retained that caused disease. But here, it was passing through the filters. And these were roughly 0.2 microns in diameter. And that's why for many years, that definition of a virus stuck. Today, we, we buy uh, filter units from Millipore, which look quite different, but they do the same thing. They let viruses pass through, B bacteria are retained on the surface, and you can take a virus stock and sterilize it, for, for example. In 1898, after the discovery of uh, tobacco mosaic, I should say that Ivanovsky and Beyerink, two scientists independently discovered uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, Beyerink called it contagium vivum fluidum, uh, and eventually they came upon the word virus, which in Latin means uh, slimy, liquid, or poison. And they actually thought it was a liquid for many years. They didn't think it was particulate. And so only when we began to see virus particles in the 1920s and 30s that we understood that a virus was a particle. But the name stuck. The first animal virus discovered in 1898 by Loeffler and Frosch, the agent of foot and mouth disease. They showed it was filterable, causes lesions uh, in animals, cows in particular. And the key concept here, again, the agents are not only small, but they don't replicate in broth. Some of the experiments these scientists did would, would be to take the filtrate and put it in a broth and try and get it to grow, but it never did. It would only grow in the animal. So it needed a living cell in which to grow. And as I said, 0.2 micron filters uh, were the key. After that, the pace of virus discovery was rather slow. Uh, a human virus, uh, 1901 yellow fever virus, rabies, Variola virus, smallpox virus, and then 1908 viruses involved in cancers, polio virus in 1908, another cancer virus in 1911. We will go through a number of these in some detail. Bacteriophages that infect bacteria in 1915, and influenza virus not until 1933. So the pace of discovery was slow, in part because we had no cell cultures in which to grow viruses. We had to do everything in animals, and it was quite arduous. And next time we'll see how that changed with the development of cell culture. <clears throat> Which is a key concept first discovered about viruses that distinguish them from other microorganisms. Too large to pass through a 0.2 micron filter, could replicate only in broth, made tobacco plants sick, small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter, and none of the above. Right, most of you got D, small enough to pass through a 2.2 micron filter. That is the early key concept that distinguished them from bacteria. Could not, viruses don't replicate in broth, they can only replicate in a cell. Uh, they did make tobacco plants sick, but that was not a key concept, right? It's something that would define all of viruses. So that's why B is correct. In the 1930s, the electron microscope was developed in Germany. You can go to Munich, in fact, in their technological museum there and see the first one. And we began to see that these viruses were not liquids or slimy poisons. They were actually particles. So we have a bacteriophage, tobacco mosaic virus, the first virus discovered. They could finally see it. Rabies virus uh, and an astrovirus. Today we know incredible details about the structure of viruses. Their structures of many have been solved first by X-ray crystallography, then by cryo-electron microscopy. We'll talk about those techniques a bit later on. This is poliovirus. Two structures, one solved by X-ray crystallography, one by cryo-EM. The resolution is different. You can go below two angstroms uh, on the X-ray structure, so you can see all of the side chains as well as the main chain, but you can't see that with the cryo-EM. This cryo-EM was about uh, 12 angstrom in resolution, so you cannot see uh, the side chains of the amino acid. You can see overall shapes. We know, for example, the chemical formula for poliovirus, which is shown here because of this. This is, of course, an average, and we'll see later on why uh, that's the case. We classify viruses. By today, now, we have discovered so many viruses that we need to classify them in a way that provides order to make sense and so that we can keep things straight. And there is a very uh, well-used classification scheme. 
We look at the nature and the sequence of nucleic acid in the virus particle, DNA or RNA, double or single-stranded, etc. Uh, we look at the symmetry of the protein shell. We'll talk about this in a separate lecture. We, we look at whether or not there's a lipid membrane surrounding uh, the virus particle. And we look at the dimensions of the virus particle and the capsid. So these, all of these criteria were originally used in the 40s and 50s and 60s. But today, they're pretty much out the window because we use one thing. We use the nucleic acid sequence of the viral genome. And from that, we can immediately classify the virus. We haven't found any, any new general classes of virus particles in a long time. We, we simply find new members of existing families. Now, remember, a lot of the sequences that we do of viruses, whether it be in us or in the environment, we can't recognize it. We think it's viral, but maybe it's new kinds of viruses that we haven't sorted out yet. And we still classify virus by a hi classical hierarchical system where we have the various levels just as we do for eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea. We start with orders and these usually end in virales. Then we have families which end in viridae like filoviridae, the family that contains Ebola viruses. We have genera like Ebola virus. Uh, and then we have species, Zaire Ebola virus. The concept of species is a little weird for a virus because, you know, originally in, in other organisms, a species is something that cannot re reproduce with another species. And viruses don't really reproduce in the same manner. So this is, it's being recognized now that species doesn't really work anymore. So these are slowly uh, going away, but we're still stuck with some, some old names. One of the most exciting areas of virology, in my view today, is virus discovery. You can take blood or urine or brain tissue. You can take lake water or seawater. You can drill into the Siberian permafrost and bring up ice cores. And you can look for virus particles in them. And you can sequence their genomes. We now have incredible methods for doing sequencing very, very quickly on many, many samples. So we can do what's called deep sequencing and analyze all the viruses that are in and around us and also in all the animals around us. So this is just one example of a study uh, done a number of years ago where investigators went to Antarctica and they drilled through the ice and beneath it is a frozen lake of fresh water. And they pull some water out, they bring it back to the lab, they can purify particles and then extract the nucleic acid and sequence them. And here in this study, they found 10,000 species of viruses from 12 different families, and some of them were completely new. The more you do this, the more new viruses you find. And in addition, as I said, you also find a lot of what we call dark matter. This is DNA that doesn't match up to anything in the database. So all these sequences are put in a publicly accessible database. And then when someone does a new experiment, they take their sequences and they compare it to the database to see what they have discovered. And still we find things uh, that we can't yet classify. So virus discovery is very exciting because it can lead to new findings about viruses. Now you may ask, why do we care? Why do we need to go out and look at all the viruses that are out there around us or in us? So here are some interesting facts. First of all, viruses outnumber cellular life by at least 10 to 1. So that means they comprise the greatest genetic diversity on Earth. Their genes are more diverse than any of the other species that are around. There's simply more of them. And it's probably fitting since they most likely uh, originated before life itself on Earth. An amazing aspect of viruses, which you didn't appreciate 15 years ago, is that they drive global cycles. All these viruses in the ocean are not just sitting there, they're lysing both bacterial and eukaryotic cells. That lysing releases soluble organic matter, which then drives all kinds of cycles, like the carbon cycle, on the Earth. And without them, probably life would stop. If we took all the viruses off the planet today, which would be very hard to do, probably life would be very different in a few weeks. Why else do we care? Viruses are probably beneficial, as I suggested earlier. And as you proceed in your careers over the next 10 years, you will see more and more evidence that this is true, certainly, in humans. And of course, some of those viruses that we discover may be the next new pathogen. This is not what drives all of virus discovery, but many people are interested in knowing 
what's out there, for example, in bats. Bats harbor a huge uh, variety of different viruses, some of which are known to infect people. Maybe the next pandemic will come from a bat. So lots of resources and effort are devoted to doing that kind of work. But in my view, the most interesting are simply finding all the viruses that are out there and seeing how they interact with the species that they infect and how they modulate and be part of this e ecosystem. So virology is really an amazing field and that's what I'm gonna try and teach you in this course. I'll give you the tools to understand it. And as we go along, I'll bring in interesting things uh, that happen as well. Now, we're gonna talk about a lot of different viruses in this course, but I wanna try and make it easy for you to put them in a kind of perspective where you can understand them. So you don't have to memorize every virus that I tell you. And these are two simple facts about virology which we'll expand upon next time that make it easier for you to be a student of virology. First of all, all the virus genomes are obligate molecular parasites. They can only function in a cell. So they have to use all of the cell machinery to function. So they have to all have something in common. And think about that. All the diverse viruses out there have to be able to work in a host cell. And that commonality is messenger RNA. They all have to make messenger RNA. So we can use that to make virology simpler. And so that's the second point. Messenger RNA has to be able to be translated by host ribosomes. So they're parasites not only of the cell but of the host protein synthesis machinery. So in the next couple of lectures we'll look at how we can use this to produce a classification that makes virology simple.